how do you encourage that type of um, innovation? We have to make sure that we do measure things and that they're important and that we monitor them but that we don't start mistaking them for the real thing. But also an example of companies shooting themselves in the foot by trying to be clever in the short term. This is what changed company, the company the most. And that was employing people with disabilities. They just kept talking about how that had changed the organizational culture for the better. You don't know why this particular group or groupings of people come to this business, why it's, it is successful? Because we imitate this high-performing firm, including the practices that may have had contributed nothing to them being high performers. Harmful management practices, just like cultural practices, including eating deceased relatives, and like viruses, can spread and survive. And it actually led me to disagree <clears throat> with a Nobel Prize winner in economics. This, this villain, if we just remove them and get a new CEO, problem solved. And of course the world uh, and life usually isn't as simple as that. And certainly the world of business isn't as simple as that either. Of course you can become angry at these people, but it happens in a context. And therefore, uh, not being judgmental or angry at people, but helping to understand the context and changing the context for people in organizations, so that they don't make these wrong choices anymore, that's actually what's important. Hello, and welcome to Conversations on Climate. My name is Chris Caldwell, and we sit down with the experts who are trying to solve the biggest challenge of our time, before time runs out. Rick, thank you so much for taking the time to come and speak to us. As, as I was saying to you off the camera, I'm really excited about this conversation, one I've been looking forward to for 10 years. <laughs> Try not to disappoint you. Okay, I'm sure you won't. Um, so um, you have two PhDs, which is quite remarkable and quite, 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 I don't quite understand why anyone would do PhDs, <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing. I need a lot of education, that is, a, that is the answer. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but you are a world leader in strategy and organizational design. Um, and you have you you look into areas of business that aren't normally looked into. It's like it's it's it's, it's bad habits. It's theory versus practice. Like what's really going on yeah. un under the under the head of a business? Can you tell us what got you into that that whole idea of uh, of thinking and research? Yeah, that's because I guess it's because also I'm a quantitative researcher. I I I, uh, I like to measure stuff. But because, indeed, I have a PhD in economics, but also a PhD in sociology, the stuff that I try to measure is usually a bit softer stuff. Um, and I like, on the one hand, the quantitative element, because it's, I like evidence. Yeah. But I do think, say, academic research, including my own research, is at its best if you use those measures and that quantitative uh, research to unveil things that you couldn't otherwise see. Uh, we have quite a bit of research also in management where people go talk to people and then uh, either they leave it at that or they confirm quantitatively what these people have been telling them. And I like it best if with the quantitative methods you show something that these people themselves weren't even aware of or so. Or that you show that it works differently in the long term than in the short term or something like that. And I guess uh, that's a bit uh, where it comes from how the world really works or so. And for that you need good academic research to show the things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see without that research. Fantastic. Well, that's, that's kind of a nice, nice kind of um, link through the, kind of the next area we want to talk about, which is the link between the social and the business. Yeah. Uh, like there's, there's a long-standing debate uh, between the value of, of, of social and the value, well, there's trade-offs between social and economics. So whether yeah. you need to be making, uh, making, making for, for the good of society, betterment of society, you need to be um, taking non-profit maximizing steps. Yeah. Yep. Um, but you, your research kind of tilts towards the other way and says, no, there's actually there's a good social case towards, for example, with the uh, Aravind uh, eye, eye care yeah. um, centre. Could you talk a little bit about, about that and the whole idea of how doing things that aren't necessarily seen as being profit maximizing might, yep. might add social value, but also be good for the business? Yeah. And, and one thing already to note there is that there's a difference between profit maximizing in the short term and in the long term, of course. And very often, indeed, uh, the short term is different than the long term. That's one of these elements that I like looking at. And therefore, sometimes these things that you say they're profit maximizing in the short term uh, seem, to, seem to be harmful, harmful in the social side. But actually, if you look at the long term, you see that the two go much more hand in hand. And as you rightly say, therefore, indeed, uh, having strategies that optimize things socially uh, can turn out to be very profitable. 
Certainly, I'm not the only one saying that. Uh, my, my dear colleague, uh, Janis Janu, has, his whole research agenda is a lot about that. That's showing that uh, ESG and, and looking at social performance in the long term um, uh, plays out well for organizations financially. And he has a good, lot of good evidence of that. I'm eager to say, though, that I certainly also think, and we know from research, that it certainly also works the other way around. Uh, it's not only social performance in the long term leading to economic performance, but actually, uh, economic performance also often leads to social wealth uh, in the sense that we have a lot of research that shows well what is the best way well of course to deal with poverty but also with malnutrition with stillbirth uh, with uh, with crime levels and so on and that economic wealth uh, in most of these cases is the main predictor of this so in a way there's also nothing wrong with making money uh, so it's indeed uh, uh, the two can go very much hand in hand but also economic wealth can be good for social performance but the best case examples, for example, are the two, of course, where, the, where you can really see the two, the, that the two go hand in hand. Um, the Aravind Eye Clinic, as you probably know, is in India uh, and specializes uh, in eye problems, but actually what they call actually preventable or curable um, eye problems. And they do surgery, for instance, cataract surgery. That's relatively simple surgery and in a way life-saving because it preserves people's, uh, people's vision. But of course, uh, had a, in, in the early days, the Aravind Eye Clinic said, well, ha we have millions of people, uh, particularly in rural India, who, who can't afford that surgery, who don't have access to clinics, and even if they had, they can't afford it. And what makes it such an interesting case is that this uh, hospital, and now big group of hospitals, um, really set out to say, we're going to drive down the cost of this surgery, uh, to such an extent that it becomes so well, um, uh, cheap, in a way, uh, that many more people can afford it. But also, what they do nowadays is that to uh, about half of the people, they uh, give the eye surgery for free. So the people who pay for it actually subsidize uh, uh, people who can't pay for it. Now, why I am interested in it, uh, and that's not necessarily what my colleagues who did the case research for are interested in it for. But why I'm interested in it, I've studied uh, much of my academic life, organizational learning, learning uh, effects within organizations. And what is interesting is that many people, of course, say, well, the, the, the paying customers subsidize the non-paying one. Uh, that's, that, that's nice. Which is true, but what people seem to not notice is that the paying customers get something in return for this. Um, even yesterday, I was having a conversation with someone uh, um, about this uh, eye clinic, and he also said to me, yeah, but, but if you strip out all the costs and so on, uh, doesn't the quality suffer? And actually what we see with the eye and eye clinic is that it's quite the opposite. Quality of the procedure goes up rather than down as a result of, well, basically the cost savings. Uh, so, for instance, you can go online and you can uh, look up uh, YouTube clips or so, and you see that the Aravind Eye Clinic uh, organizes the surgery uh, like a production line. And there's no operating theater, and then the surgeon comes in and it takes half an hour or something like that. They line up the patients, uh, they prepare them, medical personnel does everything they can do. The surgeon walks past them and only for 10 minutes does the thing that only surgeons can do. Go to the next one, the next one, the next one. And because it's so efficient, they drive the cost down. But here come the learning curve effects. Because these surgeons, but actually these whole organizations, do so many of them and are so specialized in them, is it that they become much better at it? And without the non-paying customers, they wouldn't have those large numbers. So in a way, the paying customers get better surgery as a result of them subsidizing, you could say, relatively poor people who don't have to pay for it. And I guess uh, if you would ask me, uh, say you, you pay uh, $500 and then you have this surgery and it has, I don't know, a 70% success rate, I'm completely making it up, uh, or you pay $1,000 but then it has a 90% success rate, do you want to pay $500 or $1,000? Well, I don't know about you, but I would immediately fork out $1,000. Uh, and that's actually what you get because you pay more and you pay for a, a customer getting it for free, you also get higher quality. And I thought these learning effects uh, were, the, were the, the interesting thing that I picked up uh, from all these uh, div uh, different case studies about the clinic. And they really show that social performance and economic performance can go very much hand in hand. Yeah, and that very much relates to the idea of selection at the gate. 
which you, you've done some work on as well yep. in relation to this in relation to, to uh, IVF. Um, could you talk a little bit about selection at the gates and its um, relation to social value as well? Yeah. yeah, selection at the gate is actually, uh, I, I don't think the, the term exists in the, the English language. I'm originally from the Netherlands and there it's a saying, uh, selection at the gate or um, selectie aan de poort, as we should <laughs> say in Dutch. And it's actually a lot of what, for instance, schools do. Uh, how they, uh, they select good students by also running all sorts of tests and so on. Um, and what I discovered, together with a PhD student at the time, Hela Stans, he's now at University College London, um, we discovered that IVF clinics also do this. And the reason for this is, is that uh, the English government had made it mandatory that IVF clinics publish their success rate. Uh, and they said uh, that's mandatory and actually for all good reasons, for transparency, consumer choice and these type of things. Um, but what is particular about IVF clinics, although there are other situations and, and, and uh, medical areas are the same, is that your success rate as a clinic, um, well, doesn't only depend on how good you are at the procedure. It depends on the characteristics of the patient. Uh, some patients are a lot more difficult uh, to get pregnant, basically, than others. Um, and just not to, well, mess up their position in the league table, as they call it in the industry, their success rate as a clinic, quite a few clinics started refusing difficult patients, so to speak. Older patients, difficult underlying medical conditions, and so on. And they did this because it had short-term benefits. Uh, if, you, if you don't admit difficult patients and you do only relatively easy patients, you, you're higher in the league table. But what Mihail and I discovered, and that's again an example of looking at the long term and things can work very differently in the long term than in short term, is that um, the clinics that did a lot of difficult patients improved a lot over time. Learning effects, they learned a lot from these difficult patients. Whereas these, pati these clinics that only did easy patients, they didn't improve much over time because they only did standard patients. And we noticed that after four, five, six years, the clinics that did difficult patients as well, ended up having higher success rates. Um, and again, that's a good example of, um, well, long term working differently than short term, but also an example of companies shooting themselves in the foot by trying to be clever in the short term. The thing is also that these clinics weren't aware of this. They saw the short term benefits, but we had to tell them and show them the evidence of the long term harmful consequences. And that's why academic research is important, but that's also why companies often not end up doing things that are not necessarily good for them in the long term. Yeah, I understand that. And that's <clears throat> sort of taking back to, to, to climate. Um, that's one of the things that uh, companies often do. They, they say, right, well, we need to be reducing our carbon footprints or doing whatever other sustainability measures. They just end up chopping off the particular um, most polluting activity. Yeah. And it doesn't help really because it just shifts it somewhere else so like they might outsource it to to another part of the world so it's off their books but but you know that the, the carbon is still being put in the atmosphere how do we how do we we make sure that we still get the innovation because if they if if that's if the, the chopping off wasn't the action and instead they focused in on making on decarbonizing and actually taking action to bring bring down their, their carbon footprints domestically it would it would it would benefit you know everybody including yeah. themselves how do you how do you encourage that type of um, innovation like when the easy thing to do is just chop it and push it off somewhere yeah else? yeah and and you rightly say that's the easy thing to do but it's also, uh, therefore, uh, the thing to do to do better in terms of the metrics. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a leak table, whether it's some sort of other output metric, whether it's some other ranking or so. And therefore, uh, although I'm a quantitative researcher, I've also uh, written somewhere that I have a love-hate relationship with numbers in strategy. And that's actually for that reason. Uh, with numbers you can find evidence and how things work in the long term. But if you look at numbers and, for instance, indeed, rankings, uh, metrics, uh, KPIs, uh, leak tables, and so on, then you always run the risk that uh, organizations start optimizing the numbers, huh? their ranking, for instance. Uh, and certainly that's often not what you're after because every number, every metric, every KPI is going to be imperfect and only capture part of reality. So one part of the answer is that we somehow have to make sure that we do measure things and that they're important and that we monitor them but that we don't start mistaking them for the real thing uh, and that we don't start mistaking them for being actually a goal in and of themselves. 
But, but that's a trade-off, and that's not an easy thing to do. Huh? So once you start measuring things, organizations and people uh, run the risk of becoming focused on that. Mm -hmm. um, but therefore, treating rankings not as a goal in and of itself is, 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 is crucial in this. Um, so, uh, speaking of trade-offs, uh, one really interesting part of your research is when you look at the social side, there's a lot of assumptions that if you focus in on, on, on social, social, social goods, you're going to be increasing price, reducing uh, choice. But your research suggests that isn't always going to be the case, that you can do you know, cheaper and better with like uh, Capitec as, uh, as an example? Would you? Yeah. So, uh, um, so my research, uh, as I tell to fellow academics, is uh, I, I do research on, um, on uh, norms and cognition. Uh, that is too abstract. In, in, in the real world, I say I do research on organizational transformations and so on, because norms and cognition play a big role in those. But uh, Capitec, for instance, is an example of a company that really challenged norms, industry norms. How do you do things? And that's often very difficult to change norms. They guide much more about human behavior and organizational behavior than often we're aware of. Uh, and norms relate to habits and so on and how we, how we see things. Now, Capitec, for instance, um, is a bank in South Africa, uh, but was an entrant into the banking industry. Uh, th that's already unusual because it's very difficult to enter the banking industry. There are huge barriers to entry uh, and, uh, and switching is very difficult. Once you have a bank account, you don't easily switch to something else because of the hassle. Huh? Um, Capitec, however, did manage to enter. And although, like in many countries, the UK including, um, the industry was dominated by, by, by an oligopoly, uh, a few big banks, the, top, the, the big four they were called in South Africa. They managed to not only enter, but actually also grow uh, and are now uh, the largest bank in South Africa. And they really explicitly did that by challenging norms in the industry. And I say explicitly because they showed me their business plans. Uh, and they really were all about, we're going to do things differently. We're go going to be like a traditional bank in terms of the culture and how we treat people and what we offer. We're going to be like retailers. Not coincidentally, the founders had experience both in banking and in retailing, I have to say. But even to the, such an extent that they said, uh, uh, in terms of hiring personnel, when, um, if you apply to, uh, uh, to Capitec to work there, if we see on your CV that you've worked in banking before, we don't want you. Uh, you have the wrong habits, the wrong norms. We want retailers to transition into banking. Anyway, what was Capitec's initially quite revolutionary model, and that's how it relates to social performance as well, they really went for what is called the bottom of the pyramid business model. That term has gone a little bit out of fashion or has disappeared a little bit, was very popular 20 years ago when, uh, when they entered the industry. And the, but the bottom of the pyramid business model they meant if we enter the banking industry, going head to head with one of the, uh, with the big banks, we don't stand a chance. We don't have a branch network, we don't, have, uh, uh, we don't have a brand name, we don't have anything. So we need a way around it. And they said, look in South Africa, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of people who either don't have a bank account at all, or they're sort of completely neglected by the big banks rural areas, uh, relatively poor people, or as they called it, financially illiterate people. And they said, if we enter the industry on this, those sides, we stand a chance because the big banks don't care about them. Now, that was their way into the industry, but it clearly creates an enormous economic and social wealth for these people. Because a bank account opens many doors in life, eh, to, uh, in terms of, uh, of work, in terms of setting up small businesses, in terms of it, a bank account and access to finance creates all sorts of opportunities. So by expanding and starting in these rural areas and signing up a lot of people who don't have a bank account yet or who are treated badly by the existing banks, uh, they also enabled a lot of uh, people to take charge of their own, uh, their own destinies and their own futures. Of course, once they had established themselves in these rural areas and with relatively poor people, then they started moving up into the segments in the market. And they started not only in rural areas, they started going into Cape Town and Pretoria and Johannesburg. They went to the low-end malls, they started going in the higher-end malls and so on. But by then, when the big banks said, uh, gosh, we don't want them in there, it was too late. And they were well established in the industry.
But again, it's a good example of a company coming in with a profit motive. Uh, it's, a, it's a public company, pure profit motive, you could say. Um, but doing a lot of social good in the process and really uh, um, uh, helping people take charge of their destiny, uh, so to speak, by giving people access to finance and bank accounts. And speak, speaking of motives, um, there's, uh, we so far have been talking about how businesses uh, externally you know, look, look out and try and uh, do, do good in the world in a kind of loose loo sense. Um, but you can also do it internally, and the, 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 the way that's very popular at the moment to be talking about that is, is, is purpose. Um, but you suggest that there may be dangers in, in, in wrong purpose, overly overemphasis. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, I, I do feel a little skeptical sometimes, not always, when companies uh, uh, start talking a lot about purpose in their annual reports and CEO presentations and so on. And I'm, of course, not the only one. And that's often a bit of a sign on the wall huh? that, uh, that people become a bit skeptical and start rolling their eyes a little bit. If companies speak about a higher purpose, uh, when, I don't know, a, a coffee company says, oh, we don't sell coffee, we create communities. Uh, and then they say, hey, when, when we, it, it feels a bit contrived how they come up with a higher purpose. Of course, I have nothing against purpose, but we increasingly also find out through research that it does not always work. Uh, it does not always have benefits, although they can have benefits. Um, and one element of this is, uh, that, uh, that what we know from, uh, from research, that if there's just announcements of purpose and these grand statements, but um, at the same time, employees experience well, not much strategic clarity in their organizations. And again, we have good quantitative research on this. That then it doesn't work. It's just floating and it's just sentences on the wall and on the annual report. So if you talk about grand purpose, you have to provide a lot of clarity how does it fit in with our strategy? How is it going to give us maybe even a competitive advantage? And what is it going to concretely mean, whether it's outside as a value proposition to customers, or how we organize the things differently? So just purpose, we know actually it's not going to do much. And it's going to make people rather skeptical, and probably rightly so, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, purpose coupled with strategic clarity, for instance, we do know that this can enhance uh, organizational performance and hence profits in the longer term. So I, I don't want to have anyone get the impression he's against purpose. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm against purpose just uh, in terms of hollow phrases. If you want to do it, you have to make sure you couple it at least with strategic clarity in organizations. So some businesses in their purpose will, will, will be trying to kind of you know, walk the walk, talk the talk. Um, others will kind of wheel the wheel. Uh, you, were, you wrote a, a, a paper, co-authored co a paper on the advantages of employing people with disabilities yeah. in a firm. That's a really interesting topic and one that we don't really talk about enough in the, the ESG world. Could you kind of explain yeah. a little bit about your thinking about that? And not just a kind of a look, a look how virtuous we are in, in employing people with yeah. disabilities. Like what, what are the, the real benefits? Yeah, that's actually a very recent article in the Harvard Business Review yeah. uh, with my uh, good colleague uh, Luis Alabani. Um, um, where we actually indeed looked at organizations employing people with disabilities. And it was actually a topic that I stumbled upon sort of accidentally, uh, as, she, as did my co-author, Luisa Alemani. And that's simply because I was doing some case research uh, here and there. Uh, for example, uh, where I first stumbled upon it was, uh, was a quirky company. Um, I was uh, visiting my parents in the south of the Netherlands. And uh, they're old enough that they still have a physical newspaper. There are not many people who do that anymore, but they have a physical newspaper. And of course, I looked into it. And I read there about a local company, a brewery. So a medium-sized, smallish company, but a brewery uh, near where they live. Uh, the La Trappe Brewery, it's actually called. Um, and it's a quirky company because the La Trappe Brewery is based in a monastery, uh, a Trappist monastery. But what was interesting about the article is that, um, uh, it's, uh, that uh, this is a number of years ago, so this was, uh, say, seven years after the 2008 crisis, so it must have been around 2015, 16, or something like that. And this company, in those crisis years, had been growing double digits every year, while the rest of the market was, uh, was uh, doing badly. And I remember the CEO, because I, I, I called up the CEO and I said, how come? And he said, I don't know. Uh, I said, let me come over and find out what's going on with your company. How did you find out it was growing? And that, that's what it said in the, in, the, in the newspaper article, that this company that in spite of the economic crisis was growing double digits every year for many years in a row. Um, but what triggered me indeed was that the CEO uh, sort of admitted to me, he said, I don't understand why we're growing. But when I visited them, I learned that 
um, uh, before the number of years before that economic crisis, they had actually made a big transition in terms of the internal organization on various dimensions. Um, the monks are still, they don't run the brewery, but they're the owner, and one of them is the co-CEO. And the monks, before it became popular, had insisted on ESG, had insisted on, uh, we want uh, solar panels everywhere, we want uh, energy efficient technology, uh, we want organic materials, uh, we want to deal with farmers directly and pay them a fair price, and so on. And one of the things they also had said, the monks, this is what we want in our brewery, is that they said we want to employ people with disabilities. Uh, the monk's idea was just to do good in the world. Um, but uh, <laughs> all these measures, in terms of ESG, of course, before it became uh, very popular, um, were picked up by the market. Uh, we're picked up by customers, also because the monastery gets a lot of visitors. Uh, it's a wonderful place to visit, for instance, who taste the beer, who see that they're organized. And, and as the marketing director told me, once they come visit here, these people become really real fans of the company. And inadvertently, they had changed the value proposition from just selling a well, good tasting Trappist beer to a lot more. Uh, by buying the beer, people felt that they were doing good and contributing to all these, uh, all these good things. And that became so popular that, it, uh, that the company just kept growing and growing and growing. Now, the management of the company, and actually not only the management, also people on the work floor brewing the beer, they often picked out one thing that they said, this is what changed company, the, the company the most. And that was employing people with disabilities. They just kept talking about how that had changed the organizational culture for the better, uh, the, the, the climate and the inside and so on. Well, uh, taking a step back from uh, the really quite recent to a few years ago um, and your fantastic book, uh, Break Breaking Bad Habits. Yeah. Uh, if we could kind of frame uh, the conversation around this by uh, maybe you could give an example about how a story of um, a headhunters in Papua New Guinea <laughs> <laughs> might, to what, what they might teach us in the management Yes, world. yes, headhunters, uh, cannibalism, even cannibalism. necro cannibalism <laughs> to make things worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, wonder, no, wonder yeah. It, it, it relates back to my long-standing research interest, or I say my belief about organizations, is that um, um, we, we, we look at organizations in my area and strategy as a bundle of contract or a, uh, or a bundle of resources or financial incentives and so on. But organizations at the end of the day, in my view, are just uh, social systems, they're large groups of people. And um, what we, what we increasingly know is that sort of that social element and our inclination to cooperate is literally embedded in our genes. Uh, we're, a, we're a cooperative, an extremely cooperative species. And that has become embedded in our genes and, and hence also in our behaviors. And I always think uh, that we should organize companies more with that in mind, uh, to, to, to link very well with these deeply biologically embedded inclinations by people uh, to cooperate and to contribute to, uh, to a greater good and a social system. Now that's a very abstract thing, but therefore, a number of years ago, I, um, uh, I took the initiative and I said I have to read up on uh, a cultural anthropology uh, and biological anthropology, uh, because they study groups of humans uh, and also the link between behavior and genetics, and I need to understand that better. And in uh, one of those readings, uh, I stumbled upon um, uh, a big ethnographic study on necro-cannibalism uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, in, in which, uh, which uh, started somewhere in the 19th century but persisted into the 20th century. Um, and that actually taught me quite a bit about organizations, not coincidentally, given that organizations are also large groups of people. And it actually led me to disagree <coughs> with a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Um, um, namely Douglas North. Douglas North namely said, and that was the dominant view in all of economics and in strategy and business, I would say, that competition will take care of things. Douglas North, for instance, said um, efficient and effective firms will grow and survive. Inefficient firms with bad practices, well, they will decline and die out, and hence the bad practices will die out with them. And therefore, we should see through competition that institutions, organizations, business practices automatically improve over time. 
competition will take care of things. That's your job, your business school professor. <laughs> yes, and it is competition takes care of a lot of things yeah. in nature as well. Uh, the, 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 uh, evolution, Darwin uh, is, is, is of course competition in nature and we look at competition in business. And of course the world changes indeed as a result uh, of competition. But in this particular um, um, uh, element in cultural anthropology, including the study on the, 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 the necro cannibals, Anthropologists for a long time had had the same assumption as Douglas North, the economist. They said there are certain cultural practices, rituals or so, and certainly they must be good if they persist. Because if the ritual puts the tribe at a disadvantage towards other tribes, but in hunting and space, well, the tribe will die and these rituals will die with it and we'll get better rituals. So if you see a somewhat weird ritual, then usually you have to dig a bit deeper because it will have some benefit in some way. But it was mostly in the 1970s, 80s, that cultural anthropologists had to decide and say, actually, it's not true. Certain rituals are just bizarre and, and just harmful. Uh, food binding in ancient China, uh, female circumcision or something like that. They just had to say, yeah, we do observe the persistence of certain cultural habits although they're harmful. How come they're not dying out? And through this study of the necro, necro cannibals, they started to understand why. It's a bit of a gruesome story, uh, um, uh, so, but, but uh, you don't want to hear it after lunchtime. <laughs> but what happened in Papua New Guinea, so in the 19th century, is that originally the four people, this large tribe, had a ritual uh, when a, a family member would die and there was a burial, like many cultures have. Uh, they, have uh, uh, they, they bury their deceased relatives. But at some point a new ritual emerged <laughs> where, where they would not bury their deceased relatives but eat them. Um, <laughs> I remember reading this about an eminent cultural anthropologist who wrote, the practice came about seemingly for purely gastronomical reasons, uh, which was a nice British euphemism, I think, but the, it, it, had, it had some short-term advantages because there was quite a bit of famine among the Fora people and they simply, it was an extra source of food, a bit of a bizarre form of food, but it was a, a source of food. It has actually a relationship with the IVF clinics. In the short term, it gave them benefits. But similar to the IVF clinics, in the long term, it appeared harmful. That's because they ate everything of the deceased relative, including the brain, uh, <coughs> uh, which meant that they developed a mysterious disease after a number of years. Uh, they called it Kuru, and we nowadays know it was a variant of Creutzfeldt-Jakob, or mad cow disease. And this disease ravished this very large tribe. Eventually, more than the half of the tribe died as a result of it. But they didn't stop the ritual. The ritual persisted. And the cultural anthropologists therefore found out and started making good quantitative models of this to say, ah, that's because the social practice, the ritual, actually has a survival probability of its own. Much like viruses, right? So uh, um, these cultural practices, and hence also management practices, can sometimes spread and survive, just like the coronavirus, although they're harmful. And that is because um, our own perspective in business, including by Nobel Prize winner Douglas North, is in a way egocentric. Competition, evolution, and so on happens, but it does not just benefit humans and organizations. It can also benefit the virus for instance, and similarly, it can benefit the harmful practice. If the harmful practice just spreads easily enough, huh, and it spreads quicker than it kills, so to speak, harmful practices, just like viruses, can spread and persist. And therefore, it's not that evolution doesn't work, it's not like competition doesn't work, it's just that uh, thinking that therefore it will improve business practice over time is a hugely oversimplified view of how the world works. Harmful management practices, just like cultural practices, including eating deceased relatives, and like viruses, can spread and survive. And just taking it into the, the business world, uh, there would, like the example uh, that you give of the, the newspapers, that be a good example of, of, of how a harmful, not 
no, not massively destructive practice, but certainly a massively inefficient practice. It was just yeah. something that we do. Is that, that a good example of it? Or, do you, or if, you, if you have a better example, please. No, but because certainly, of course, what, what is different between cultural practices, including organizational management practices and the viruses, is that people usually don't adopt the virus voluntarily. They say, well, let me have a coronavirus. That happens. Cultural practices, including business practices, organizations adopt voluntarily. And then you have to think, oh, why would they ever adopt something uh, although it's harmful, it's inefficient, it's ineffective. And there can be many reasons for this, including that it could have benefits in the short term, as we saw with the IVF clinics. But it's sometimes also the case that this particular practice can have had beneficial effect in a different context or in a different time period. And the newspaper article um, uh, example that you refer to is one of those. Um, um, it's, it's an example that I stumbled upon as well, I have to say. Um, um, it's just, and it was actually when I just arrived at London Business School, my gosh, uh, tw tw 20 years ago. So it was 2000, uh, 2002 or three, 2004, I started working with The Guardian. Um, and um, <laughs> I was living in Notting Hill at the time. Uh, and I was uh, always taking a tube to London Business School. And initially when I started uh, living in Notting Hill, I thought, oh, 20 minutes in a tube, that's a nice way to ease into the day. I'll buy a morning newspaper and read it in the tube. And I quickly discovered that that was not going to happen. Uh, rush hour in the tube in London, you couldn't read a newspaper in the tube. But when I started working with The Guardian, I therefore literally asked them, I said, why do you make these newspapers so ridiculously big? It would be so much easier if they're just smaller. I could read them in the tube uh, and so on. Um, um, and then The Guardian, because I had therefore assumed, I thought always it's probably cheap to print big sheets of paper. But when I started working with The Guardian, they told me actually it's a bit more expensive than small. Sister, why don't you make it small? And at the time they said, oh, customers wouldn't want it. Why not? And they said, well, look at all companies, newspaper companies in the world, they all have big sheet breeze newspapers. Uh, that's just the way they are. That's what customers want. Now, maybe you're old enough to remember, <laughs> but in 2004, the Independent, uh, then there's the first newspaper in the world, halved the size of its newspaper, uh, and they had to try something because they were about to go bankrupt. Uh, and so a search in circulation. Then, as you may remember, the Times, then half the size of the newspaper, saw a search in circulation. Other newspapers started following. Also, The Guardian had to make a small newspaper. It started spreading across the world and so on. And then we learned, gosh, uh, customers do like it. They prefer a smaller newspaper. Um, but then, I, of course, I was left with the question, where did this bizarre practice come from? these large newspapers. And I have to admit that uh, I couldn't find the answer initially. Because of course I asked people at The Guardian, I said, we don't know, it has always been like this. And I couldn't find the answer and I, and I should give credits to two MBA students who I then hired to find the answer for me. Uh, because they did. And they, uh, they remember they spent two days in the British Library and they said, we found it. Uh, it started in 1718. Uh, in 1718, the then English government uh, started taxing newspaper companies based on the number of pages that they printed. After which newspaper companies said, well, just paid three pages, that's it, but we make them this big. Uh, when this tax law was abolished in 1855, everybody just continued it. And that is relevant, it's a bit of an extreme story, but it's relevant because sometimes practices come about for all the right reasons in a particular setting and time period. When then things change, companies often just and whole industries persist with doing things in the same way. So if there's difficulties in following kind of theory and bad practice, why can't we just follow good practice? Like find a, a model business and say like, you know, in this world, like a Unilever or a Patagonian to say, okay, well, we'll just do what they do. Yeah. yeah. Why don't we just do that? Yeah. Now, uh, frankly, uh, uh, what we also now increasingly know that even that is embedded in our genes. We look for high performers and we imitate them uh, and then, because we don't quite know why, what they do to make them high performance, we imitate everything. Uh, there's, for instance, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, primitive societies where uh, the highest status person is the best hunter, for instance, or the best farmer. Um, and then we say, well, we see that this farmer has the best crops, but what exactly does he do to do this? 
let's just imitate everything of this person. We still see that now in societies as well. We, 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 we uh, ask uh, Cristiano Ronaldo for his political views or something like that. Well, yeah, this political views we know didn't help him uh, score uh, 50 goals in the Champions League and whatever it is or something like that. But we just inclined to imitate everything of high performers. That is therefore natural behavior. Um, but again, it can sometimes be a source of uh, yeah, uh, misleading management practices and also imitating bad behaviors. Because we imitate this high-performing firm, including the practices that may have had contributed nothing to them being high performers. It could even be practices that they only later adopted. And therefore, we can sometimes see that high-performing firms are sometimes the source of bad practices spreading. Everybody imitated GE uh, at some point or something like that. Uh, but if GE did something that was not so useful, everybody also imitated it because they didn't know what led to their success. So uh, the, the, these, are, these can also be sources of management myths and bad practices coming about, but even spreading. Mm. And is that really because of uh, just causal ambiguity? You, just, you don't know why this particular group or groupings of people come to this business, why it's, it is successful? Yeah, and that's indeed a term that we put on as causal ambiguity. Yeah. And that's ambiguity, uncertainty. We don't quite know the cause and effect relationship. Think back of the four people in Papua New Guinea uh, eating their deceased relatives. They had no trouble seeing that they were in trouble. Uh, people were dying everywhere. Uh, they saw the problem, but what they didn't see is the cause of it. And that's because the cause of it was 10 years ago. Mm. It's the same in IVF clinics. These IVF clinics that we interviewed and visited, they could also see, gosh, our success rates is lagging behind. What they couldn't understand is the cause of it. Oh, that's because seven years ago, we started selecting at the gate. And that's what makes it difficult to really understand bad practices. You see the harmful consequences, you don't quite necessarily see the cause of it. Mm. And therefore it's also just difficult to stop. Yeah, yeah. and you mentioned this, uh, everyone's copied GE at some point, or you know, some, some aspects of, of, uh, of a big, big brand companies you may have heard of. Has globalization added to this, this to, to the impact of this effect? Yeah, um, in, in some ways, Probably, yeah, because we imitate practices and we also started imitating them in other cultural environments. And we actually have good research on this as well, where it shows that practices that may be good in a certain context certainly don't work in others. Um, and we also have that in management. There's a famous uh, research project by a guy called Mark Sabraki, who at the time was at the Wharton School, who even examined the old system of total quality management. As you may remember, that came about actually in the 1980s in Japan or so, and worked there tremendously well, but was just transported to a US setting. And one of the things that he observes is to say simply, well, it, it's a good practice in that setting, transfer it to the US, and there it's actually not, and it may be actually be harmful. And therefore, the globalization that we simply just apply practices in one setting and yet another setting can contribute to that. Not because the world is becoming completely homogeneous, no, because different settings are still very different. And therefore, a practice in one location might still not quite work the same in another location. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm sure globalization plays certain roles in this. Uh, and also, indeed, in the, uh, the spread of, uh, human, of viruses like corona, but also the spread of management practices. And um, it is inevitable, and it is happening, that uh, myths uh, bad, uh, are happening in the ESG world. How do we um, protect against that? Like, is it just the kind of cost of doing business, or do we, um, is it something that we can be culturally within, within the movement or within our businesses be, be trying to, to focus yeah. in on trying to stop them from happening? Yeah, so I think several of the risks that we have been talking about um, uh, in, in this conversation also indeed apply to an ESG setting. For instance, also the element of metrics uh, and, uh, and how do you do in the ranking or so in terms of uh, when, uh, when uh, we start to mistake the ranking itself uh, uh, for the goal rather than the underlying practices and the imperfections that come with this. And I think this, this element of myths is also at risk here for ESG uh, and purpose and, and other aspects of social performance. Uh, that we really have champions of it uh, and that we, and with all the best intentions and that we apply this as well and then we present it and we, we, uh, we talk much more about the benefits than the drawbacks and so on. Uh, the difficulty is, of course, that these risks are very real and people do them with the best of intentions, uh, but then uh, you, you don't achieve what you're really after. So I do think these risks are real that we've been talking about. Um, 
Also, because indeed in social performance and so on, there's also this, this difficulty of causal ambiguity. It's not something you do now and you see the results. Yeah, you may see some of the results, but some of the results also come in only in the longer term. And therefore, it's difficult to really separate cause and effect. There are no easy answers to that, but awareness of these type of risks is very, uh, is very important in there, I think. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. That's a shame, because that's, that's why myths occur, because you want easy answers. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And, uh, and we also know uh, that there's a, a human inclination to, uh, 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 in terms of causal ambiguity, also to look for a simple answer and say, what caused it? Uh, again, we also know this from social psych research. People prefer easy answers also so that we can fix it next time. And this is what the cause or this is who the cause was. And this was this, this villain. If we just remove them and get a new CEO problem solved. And of course, the world uh, and life usually isn't as simple as that. And certainly the world of business isn't as simple as that either. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's very true. Before we move on to heroes and villains, um, something else that's, that's kind of comes um, out, of, out of business and uh, any new ideas and new movements like ESG is, it's not just, um, just myths, it's also jargon. Um, yeah. So what, um, why does jargon happen and what is the effect? Yeah. So indeed, I'm, I'm in the process of doing a fairly large research project with a now also former PhD student, uh, João Cotras Salvado. He's now in, uh, he went back to, uh, to Portugal and is a professor at Catolica. Um, but we looked at indeed management jargon. Uh, another research project that, that came about a bit uh, by, by having conversations with people and so on. But of course, management jargon, uh, jargon exists for good reasons. Eh? Medical jargon, technical jargon, sometimes it's just very efficient to, uh, to use technical language. It's more precise, it's shorter and so on. And management jargon is not necessarily different from that. But in all these aspects, whether it's medical, technical or management, jargon is often also used for other purposes. Sometimes it's used to exclude others. Sometimes it's to, uh, used uh, to, uh, to uh, create some air of legitimacy, uh, to make ones look a bit more uh, important, uh, to sometimes also obfuscate and hide a few things and so on. And therefore, uh, I guess that's one reason why there are so many websites about uh, ma well, management myths or business jargon or uh, corporate bullshit or so, uh, these type of things. Because it also makes people very skeptical uh, if they hear a lot of terminology. And this research project came about by an analyst uh, who I spoke to. And I asked this analyst, what do you look for if you attend the CEO presentation? Because the analyst had to uh, decide, am I going to recommend buy or sell or so for this stock? And she told me, she said, well, when I hear a lot of this management jargon, I become very skeptical. And I thought that's actually interesting because jargon, people use it, of course, for the opposite purpose, uh, to, uh, to actually be very precise or uh, so, or to talk up the share price or so, but it actually also makes people skeptical. And with this former PhD student, I decided to measure it. And we just collected hundreds of CEO presentations to the market where people used more or less management jargony language. And we thought, well, does the stock market uh, um, uh, through financial analysts actually work the same as the general public? Do they get a bit of an itch because of this management jargon? Or do they actually appreciate it? Or are they maybe impressed by it or so? And it uh, appears that the stock market is just like you and I. Uh, they, they, they get itchy uh, as a result of management jargon. And uh, uh, for instance, acquisitions presented, uh, very similar acquisitions presented with or without management jargon, the stock market punishes management jargon. They don't like woolly language that seems intended to impress, but is also a bit vague and abstract. And I do sometimes hear similar reactions to language around purpose or social performance or ESG or so. And you have to watch out for that. Even if you're using that language uh, to show you're an insider and for all the best intentions, that can backfire in terms of making people skeptical. Uh, we can measure it in the stock market, but it's probably true for, uh, for wider audiences. Um, but when people are looking, I'm going back to the kind of ESG frame here, but when people are looking for, for that type of concrete example that, or, or concrete data that, that we're talking about, well, it's pretty hard in, in ESG. Um, and one of, the, um, one of the, the pillars of the kind of breaking bad habits that you, you, you place out there is um, you shouldn't be benchmarking. 
Yeah. There's a big pressure, um, and for good reasons, for very, very good reasons, for in the SG world, uh, for more reporting, more, more rankings, more, yeah. more, more, more benchmarking, essentially. Um, what's the danger of benchmarking? And if benchmarking is suboptimal, how do we hold firms to account? Yeah, yeah. Benchmarking goes back to the topic that we spoke about earlier as well about imitation, including saying uh, in primitive tribes uh, the the best hunter has the highest status. Let's just imitate everything of Cristiano Ronaldo and of the best hunter, and uh, maybe we'll become as good as well. And benchmarking quite explicitly is a step to do that. Let's look at the top performing companies. Uh, what do they do? Maybe we should do the same. Frankly, I see it often here in London Business School as well. Uh, when we have a curriculum review from our MBA program, we always say, let's do some benchmarking. What do the top 10 schools in the world uh, do? Uh, and then, oh, they all have courses on this. We should do it as well. Now, there is a homogenization element uh, as a result of that. But it's also, indeed, it's difficult to differentiate then. But it's also, yeah, you, you also imitate a lot more than the things that just lead to high performance. So benchmarking is indeed, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm again not saying you know, don't do it at all or something like that, but you should be aware of the dangers of this. Just that everybody's doing it, or a lot of companies or people are doing it, doesn't mean you should do too. Uh, it shouldn't re replace judgment uh, in that sense. Um, uh, therefore, indeed, uh, uh, benchmarking in the, uh, when it comes to ESG, of course, runs a similar risk. Uh, that we say, let's just see what high-performing companies are doing and do the same. It runs again the risk uh, also that we're optimizing the measures rather than the underlying thing itself. And again, the risk that we're um, adopting things that may work for these companies, but they're in slightly different situations. It may not work for us and so on. Another one of the um, ideas that you, you have for breaking bad habits is change for change's sake. Yeah. Now, that in itself sounds like someone would write in a quarter of you and just say, yeah, yeah. In a couple, it doesn't sound like a positive. You know. could, could you explain your thinking behind that? Yes, that's, a, that's, a, that's an article I also wrote in the Harvard Business Review together with my colleagues Fanny Spodernam at INSEAD and Ranji Galati at the Harvard Business School. Uh, and I have to say, I sometimes jokingly say when I talk about this in the class or something like that, that uh, I've never written anything that has, uh, has given me uh, to receive uh, so much hate mail as that article. Uh, and it, there's actually more than a grain of uh, truth uh, in that. Uh, um, uh, the, the article's title I put on it was indeed Change for Change's Sake. And it is what we said, in organization there's value in the process of change itself. But clearly I started getting emails that, uh, <clears throat> that, weren't, that weren't always polite, uh, that, weren't, that were saying, oh, you, oh, you idiot, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going through my third reorganization in five years and now you're stimulating my boss to do more than by writing in the Harvard Business Review there's value in it. Now it's a little bit more complex than that, but there's some truth in it. Um, we did say and find, because there's good research underlying it, that there is value in the process of change itself, just changing organizations. And I don't mean completely reshuffling departments, although that could be the case, but it also is occasionally having a different remuneration system or a different cooperative group. Or, uh, uh, so it, ca it can be a variety of things in what you could say the formal organization. And the benefits that come from that is because gradually over time, Organizations get set in their ways. They do become siloed, like many people in large organizations say. We become siloed. Things get routinized. That is inevitable in organizations. And just changing the organizations or the remuneration system and so on can give people a different mindset and open their eyes a bit. Um, and again, that goes a bit back to what we're genetically uh, inclined to do. And one genetic component in us humans that also relates to cooperation is social learning. We learn from others. Therefore, it's sometimes hugely beneficial to sometimes be paired somewhere else. And that can be temporarily, but, but be placed in a different factory or work with a different people or you're, you're in technology, but you have to work at sales for a while or something like that. Um, no, I can see how, how kind of changing in a team um, and like spending some time in one one team as another can open your eyes and change your change your change your views. I'm kind of struggling to understand how changing your remuneration structure can yeah. can can have a similar impact. Would you like to? Yeah. yeah. So I, I I interviewed a guy called Al West, and Al West um, um, was the founder and CEO of SEI Investment, a huge fund of fund managers. Yeah. And I actually met him because one of my EMBA Global students yeah. said to me, uh, "My boss is a serial changer." And I thought, this is a guy I need to talk to. 
<laughs> what, works for Kellogg's. <laughs> uh, yeah, what, what, he, what, uh, what he meant is that he said uh, he's always trying to make changes in the organization. And when I first met him uh, here in their offices in London, uh, he said, yeah, I'm changing the remuneration system. And I forgot whether it was from individual incentives to team incentives or the other way around. But I do remember that he said, yeah, I changed it three years ago as well. And I, yeah, I probably change it again three years from now. <laughs> and I said, Al, do you think you'll ever get it right? And then he looked at me and he said, no, of course not. There is no one right remuneration system. He said, I use remunerations to open people's eyes. If I give them individual remuneration and incentives, I focus them on their individual task. Mm -hmm. But then I want them to broaden up and see how that links with other parts of the organization. So I give them remuneration based on their performance as well. And once I've done that for a while, they're much more aware of how they need to cooperate with others. And then maybe I can go back to individual incentives or organizational ones and so on. So the remuneration system is not necessarily for the financial incentive itself, but it's to change people's mindset mm -hmm. and make them understand better how their job fits in, for instance, with other parts of the organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And when you're trying to drive uh, the type of like change you're talking about, like it's, it's, it is very relevant in the kind of sustainability yeah. of conversation. Um, how do you go about like protecting dissenters? Yeah. Yeah, because that's indeed very important. I, I very often see this also when I give a keynote speech at a company conference, for instance. Eh? I give the top 100, uh, I, I give a speech or so. Uh, what I get approached um, for and by whom afterwards is very often people who have recently joined the organization who then tell me, yeah, we also have some of these bad habits. I see them, but they've all been here so long they don't see it anymore that you could do it differently. And that's the tricky thing. Newcomers can often see this, but the tricky thing is that they're a small minority and they get swept aside by the big majority who says, we've always done it this way, we know this is how things work. Um, and therefore, you need to protect these dissenters a bit. Mm -hmm. And there's various ways in doing this. I think organizations can do it explicitly uh, and develop some practices around uh, for instance, after half a year, we get new people in the room and we see what do you think should be changed. And I, and I guarantee you, you get long answers, what they think uh, could be done differently. But it's also um, what we know from social psych, and this goes back to the 1950s, the famous Usher studies on conformity, that as, uh, as a team, for instance, we're inclined to, um, to uh, not pay attention to uh, an individual with a dissenting opinion. Uh, we all agree there's just one individual who doesn't agree. And, and the top management says, uh, the, the, this top manager went home, he wanted to spend time with his family, or uh, she wanted to pursue other opportunities or something like that. What we know, and for some of my own, own research, but going back to these 1950s studies by Ash on conformity, that we do pay attention to people if they're in a group, and it doesn't have to be a big group, let alone a majority, as long as it's multiple people. And that is what organizations could facilitate as well. That we don't leave them as individuals, but that we, um, that we sometimes have multiple new people in the room, but also what we have explicit practices that we say, we put the new people together in the room, whether they have some agreement what we should be doing differently. And that's indeed, sometimes it's uh, protecting the centers, and this goes back to this concept that's very popular nowadays of psychological safety uh, in organizations. People should be free to speak up, but we should also facilitate something, uh, some of these processes that their voices are being heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that um, can lead into another point you were making about separating um, advocacy and decision making. Yeah. So that's actually a point that is very explicitly my co-author Nero's research, and uh, that he shows that uh, this escalation of commitment often builds up in the preparation phase. Think an acquisition or something like that, or a new project, a new, new product development project. Uh, people champion it, uh, championing it, going back to this earlier research uh, on champions in total quality management. Uh, they, they pave the way, they prepare the ground for this new project, this new acquisitions or the new practice. And then it's often the same decision maker where we're going to do it. But Nero's research shows is that if possible, you should separate the roles. Someone prepares the ground, gets all the details, gets all the numbers, and then someone else judges the situations and says, are we going to go ahead with this acquisition, yes or no? That's not always possible, but that's certainly one element that can already help quite a bit. Uh, because the emotional attachment and the escalation of commitment builds up and therefore you want someone else who comes into the situation somewhat more objectively to make the decision. 
Okay, so uh, if we're kind of shifting up a level, mm -hmm. um, away from the from the micro to the like from the the individual and the firm to kind of industry level. Um, in the whole the whole world of decarbonisation um, and the whole world of climate change, a lot of stuff is going to change. Like really, a ridiculous amount of stuff is going to change. Every industry have, will need to be living with uh, with a, a new normal to some some lesser or greater extent. Yeah. Um, how are we going to deal with that? Um, in the industry, we tend to look for uh, for, for the new, exciting kind of up, upcomer, uh, yeah. you know, the, the clean tech innovator, to be trying to solve problems. But your research suggests that the incumbent may itself be pretty well placed to be trying to um, yeah. try, 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 try to deal with it. Um, the example I'm trying to get to here is is like what can the, the say the, the champagne industry yeah. you know, tell us about an old yeah. incumbent um, you know evolving? Yeah, that's a that's a tricky problem about changing industries. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, the, the study that you refer to uh, on, the, on the champagne industry that I've done, uh, or better, the market for champagne grapes, um, with my, uh, my also former PhD student, although she, was at, uh, she went to Yale and she was at Yale when we did this project, she has moved to McGill now, but anyway, is Amandine Odi. Uh, and we did a huge study actually on the market for champagne grapes to look at indeed how does change happen in this industry. Because this is a very old industry with very strong norms, so formal regulations, but even stronger informal regulations, how you should behave and how not. Um, and indeed, uh, there are relative newcomers and outsiders to this industry. And we usually say change will have to come from outsiders. Uh, because indeed the, 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 the existing companies have vested interests, they have strong beliefs, they have, uh, they've been there for a long time. Change will happen by newcomers, outsiders, and so on. And although that's partly true, um, the example we spoke about earlier about Capitec entering the banking industry, not coincidentally, is an entrant, an outsider coming in. But what we found, maybe somewhat unfortunately, in that big study on the champagne industry, is these outsiders would be trying to change things, but they couldn't. Um, so they did see possibly beneficial changes. They wanted to do them, but they just couldn't pull it off. Yeah, so that, that, uh, that of course, actually relates to my, uh, the work by my valued colleague, Michael Jacobides, who looks at business ecosystems, namely that organizations don't operate in isolation. Uh, you're still very dependent on lots of other organizations in this industry, uh, for instance, for critical resources. Uh, in the case of champagne houses, for instance, you may think I would like to do things differently. Right? Uh, I, would, um, uh, I would like to make some of my own grapes. I'd like to make sparkling wine in England or something like that. Uh, but in France, you're still going to be dependent on this critical resource of champagne grapes. And if the farmers say, we don't like that you're trying to change things, yeah, you are dependent on them. And what we did show in this research is that these farmers, if you're trying to change things, punish you for it. Uh, they try to deter you from doing things differently. Uh, they, they treat you badly, they call you names, they give you bad grapes, they might not give you grapes at all, they will demand a higher price for the grapes just because you're trying to do things differently. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, that makes it extra difficult and therefore one conclusion coming out of this research is the established firms may not be so much motivated initially to try and change things, but they're often better positioned to try and change things because we notice the farmers accept a lot more from them than from relative outsiders. All right, so just to, uh, to wrap up, kind of one, one kind of final question. Uh, we've been talking a lot about you know, bad habits and um, you know, not falling into traps and things like that. Um, but if you could kind of flip it around, like, is there a habit that you have might have developed in later life that you would recommend to you know to to to, to people, listeners, uh, viewers out there <laughs> that you might wish uh, you might say you should adopt this? This this is this uh, is great. I've been saving the hardest question for last. I remember. <laughs> I, I know this. Uh, yes, that's of course not my research. Uh, maybe introspective research. That's a little bit more difficult. But um, no, well, if I had to pick one. Because I was being interviewed a while ago, uh, Deet, and but the people asked me how, how I changed over time <coughs> with age uh, as, a, as an academic. And I heard myself saying, because I've studied quite a lot of anthropology in a way, right? although I'm not an anthropologist, I studied a lot of ethnographies that eth anthropologists did. And I increasingly find that I'm sort of an, uh, almost feel like an alien ethnographer myself. Uh, I observe the world, um, uh, uh, but not necessarily with judgment. 
saying this is right or this is wrong, let alone that I get angry because people behave in a certain way. And that's because there's always a cause to people's behavior. Even if there's employees in Volkswagen who, uh, who basically commit fraud to make their emissions look better, of course you can become angry at these people, but it happens in a context. And therefore, uh, not being judgmental or angry at people, but helping to understand the context and changing the context for people in organizations so that they don't make these wrong choices anymore, that's actually what's important. Mm. So I think uh, that's, if I had to pick something, then maybe that's it. I'm sure my children would come up with completely different things, but I, that's one that I would pick. Uh, be objective and, uh, and not judgmental in, uh, in, uh, in the seeing situations, because much human behavior is driven by the situation and not just because the person is good or evil. Yeah, no, absolutely. And in, in that's very relevant in the conversation around climate, mm. where like nobody goes up, uh, grows up through through as a child saying, you know, we want to be polluting the world, want to yeah. be working, making the world a, w a worse place. Yeah, not being judgmental, understanding the, the the framework that makes people do what they do and trying to change it is yeah. This whole, this whole, this whole issue that we need to try and face this um, existential crisis. It is, it's systemic. It's not. Yeah, and so it's about changing the systems rather than calling individuals villain and punishing them for it. Yeah. Or as in the case of Fred Goodwin throwing bricks through his window, uh, that is not going to change things. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us on that conversation. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you uh, learned something. If you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and to subscribe to any of our channels and we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. These are conversations that you just can't afford to miss.